Next, we're going to talk about um, this kind of follow up on the last lecture. And I'll then go on to talk about lineations because we're going to see those in the field. So we talked about cleavage and foliation. So let's distinguish these two things. So what is a foliation? So you might remember foliation, um, that word relating to folia, like leaves, like leaves in a book. So it's, it's a planar surface. produced as a result of deformation. So it's different than like a bedding plane. That's a planar surface produced by sedimentation. So foliation is something that is a planar and happens because of structural geology kinds of things. Um, and so then what is a cleavage? That's what we, we talked a lot about cleavages in that, in that PowerPoint, that um, lecture. So cleavage is, is a kind of foliation. So it's a foliation with a special property. It's a foliation along which the rock breaks preferentially. So cleavages, and oftentimes foliations are cleavages also. So they're, they break easily along those planes. And one really, really important uh, take home from that lecture, I'll write it out here, cleavage planes generally occur parallel to the axial planes of passive folds. So it doesn't, it wouldn't have to be that way. Um, the axial plane is just a sort of imaginary geometric quantity that structural geologists have come up with. Um, so from, from that, the fact that they are, that they do tend to be the same, we, we, we realize that, that passive folds occur mainly by dissolution. So that's that, that's, that's another word synonym for the pressure solution, so dissolving in, in, a, in a solution. Passive folds occur mainly by dissolution on cleavage planes. So that's just a bit of review um, from the last lecture. So next we're going to talk about lineation. So we've talked about lineations before, how we can measure the trend and plunge and how there's L tectonites. So we're going to, we're, we're going to sort of just go in a little bit deeper to that, review that a little bit. So lineations are these linear features. Um, so why do we care about the lineation? So one, for one thing, they can, um, give they give it this orientation of primary features. So, for example, in a lava flow, there may be crystals of feldspar, and the, as the lava is flowing, now those will get oriented and they'll point in the direction that the flow is going. Or a stream will have um, elongate cobbles that'll rotate into the direction that the stream is flowing. That can be very useful for if you find a deposit of a stream, figuring out, you know, what, what direction the land was tilted, what direction a river was flowing. They can give flow directions 
And in this case, um, thinking about like if you have on a on a deep fault, on, or on a on a, even a shallow fault. So lineations can show you like which direction was the the were the rocks moving relative to each other. And we'll talk about more more about that in another lecture. They can also define the fold axes. So a fold fold axis is a lineation. So we need to under we need to know a little bit about them in order to describe a fold properly. So there's different kinds of lineations. Stretching lineations is one kind that we've we've talked about with when we when we had Plato. Um, so we, if you took a bunch of balls of Play-Doh and you, and then you put them together and then you kind of squeeze them in a certain way, let's, and then you cut out a cube block, we've seen this before, one end is going to show kind of just circular sections and then the other is going to show, other sides are going to show the, the stretched aspect. Okay, so this is, there's nothing plainer about this. Um, these are what we call stretching lineations, and they form by constriction. So I don't think we've mentioned constriction. So constriction, basically imagine like a, like a bow constrictor, a, bow, a snake swallowing something, and then it gets squeezed either inside the snake or the snake wraps around it and constricts you. You get, you get squeezed in much the same way that, the, that these originally spherical objects are, are squeezed and elongate. So you make the, the cigar shape. Um, so the stretching can happen by that. Con constriction or shearing, like in a, in a simple shear set setting. Shearing of formerly equant objects. All right. And another type of lineation is an intersection lineation. So this is um, an example of this is the, the, the pencil structure. We sh showed a slide of that. If you take a, you know, if there's like two cleavages that are a bedding and a cleavage that intersect. So let's say we've got some, some body of rock and it's got some, some layering that's vertical. Say that set, of, set of, let's say that's a cleavage and let's say it also has some, um, some bedding that's dipping slightly. And the rock also tends to dip along the bedding, okay? Or sorry, break along the bedding. So out of this are going to fall chunks of rock that are that are linear shaped. So this is what we call intersectional lineation. There's there's nothing really linear except that there's two planes and two planes intersect in a line. Um, and it'll and tend to break off chunks. Okay, another kind of linear feature that we will see out in the um, on the field when we go out and look in St. Nicholas Park, something called boudinage. So what is boudinage? It's originally continuous. competent layer that is stretched and broken into sausage-like segments called boudins. So 
Boudin, boudin is um, French for sausage, so boudinage is, I guess, sausage making. So what does this actually look like? Um, so it's, often we see this, often we see it in, in, in two dimensions, and in which case it looks something like this. So there's some layer often um, and it's broken into pieces. Often it's like a, a lighter colored quartz rich stuff. And then there's other layers that aren't broken. They're just kind of smeared out. Okay, so, so we infer this, okay, this stuff used to be a layer and there was, there was um, sort of stretching. And some of the layers were able to flow, but some of them were, were what we call more competent. They, they, they fractured, they were stronger, which caused them to actually fracture. And so in, in three dimensions, Something like, looks something like this. So we, could, we, have, we, we see the planar feature, but there's also this is a linear feature. The Buddhas themselves are lines. Okay, so this. Um, this is one type of linear feature, but this process of boudinage and this idea of um, different viscosity material being, getting, you know, behaving differently is something we've seen from early on, from the strain lectures where we, where we, we assembled those lighter chunks uh, into an original um, layer. And we'll see that now that it's, the weather's warmed up and uh, we can go look in St. Nicholas Park. So another type of lineation is a slicken line. So this is a lineation defined by fine grooves on a fault surface. So this is, I'll show a picture of this later um, but faults are planes and then they'll, they'll basically be scratched um, or or veins will form and these will have sort of lines that indicate the direction that the fault is moving so final topic here measuring, how do we measure lineations? So we will be attempting this in the lab. Um, so we, we've already talked about trend and plunge. And the way that we could measure a trend and plunge, um, trend and plunge is a uh, we could stand over a linear feature, hold our compass above it, and, and, and figure out what direction it's pointing. That would give us the trend. And then we could lay our co compass on it sideways and measure the angle. That would be the plunge. So there's another way to do it, um, which you should know about, which is the rake. So the rake is something you can do once you, if you already know the strike and dip of, 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 the, of the surface, if, the, if it's a, li a line that's in a plane that you already know, um, you, it's a little bit easier to measure. The angle between horizontal and a linear feature
measured in the plane containing the feature. So let's illustrate this rake idea. Okay, so we're going to draw a plane, inclined plane. Okay, so this, this plane has a strike like that, it's dipping down that way. Let's say that this plane has a some kind of lineation on it that we want to measure. Okay, so the rake is just there's the strike that which is the horizontal line, and there's the angle. There, there's the line, and we can just simply measure that angle. Let's call it theta. So theta is what we call the rake. And um, so let's say that this was, let's say that this linear feature was um, a slicken line. It was, a, it was the direction of motion on a fault. So if we, if we looked, let's just look at that, um, that we're just going to look straight down on that plane. So it's got these, these lines in it. Okay, so we were looking at this angle, theta. So we could think about this as kind of, okay, here's, this would be the, the strike slip. You could break it into the components motion strikes strike slip component and this would be the dip slip component um, that's kind of an aside the the main thing here is just this idea of rake if we have we don't necessarily need to take a trend and a plunge if we if we know the strike and dip um, then it, all, the rake is the only thing we need to get the line. So it's just one more measurement. So let's say on a stereo net, for example, what that looks like. Let's say that this, this is north in the map. Okay, so the plane here is dipping to the east moderately. So on a, on a stereo net, it's going to look something like that. And so this angle, you know, if you recall on the stereo net, the, 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 the graph, it's a graph paper. You can, you can um, count out up to, you know, up to 90 on these lines. So we could take that, that angle, if that's 20, you know, we would count along, this would be horizontal, count along. So let's say for theta equals 20. So that's how we would, we would just count along there to get to plot a lineation based on a strike and dip and rake measurement. So let's just write that down. Um, so For, for a rake measurement, we first need a strike and dip. So for example, this measurement would be um, north, zero, east for the strike a dip of say 30 degrees east for the strike and then the rake would be 20 south so we need to say oh it's it's coming down from the south versus coming down for the north up here this would be 
20 north break. So we have strike, dip, break. We could have also stood above this, measured a trend and plunge, and, 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 and just plotted the dot without ever knowing that plane. That's another approach. That's kind of how we did it when we did the Stereonet lab. So to do this measurement in the field, you need a you need your protractor with you. But it turns out this is actually a lot faster a lot of times and more accurate than um, trying to measure the trend and plunge. Trend and plunge is often it often helps to um, like if if you're going to measure a trend and pl plunge, it often helps to just to like put like a pencil or some or a stick or something, lay it right on the surface uh, and then kind of you can visualize it easier as you're putting your compass on it to measure it. So let's look at some images of, of some linea lineations. So this shows the next three slides are slick in line. So these are these like this is a probably a granite it looks like big crystals of you know igneous crystals. And it's and you can see there's these sort of grooves and lines have been looks like you know scraped along. So this happens at very cold, low temperatures near the surface. Here's another example of a of, of silicon lines in a granite. So the granite itself doesn't really have any apparent planar or linear aspect, but where there where it was a, a very minor fault. Um, these develop, and this, these can tell you the direction. You know, was it a, a strike slip fault or was it a, a thrust fault based on their orientations? Here's another example. Um, so, this is the fault itself is very much a, a planar feature, as in the other slides, but you can see these lines in it. So, so slick, slick and lines or slicks for short. Are sort of one of the easier ways to visualize um, uh, lineations, or lineations that exist on, on this case, also on a plane. Okay, so here's an image of of Budins. So we have this this layer, um, this darker layer in this case. Is, is, is broken, cracked, and this stuff you can see is kind of flowed in between. There's another slide showing Budins. So there's there's a Budin, there's some more of it, more of it there. So this formerly continuous layer and then probably a sandier layer and then looks like um, a softer, maybe carbonate or, lime, or marble it kind of was able to flow in between. There's another example. So in this case, it's, probably, it's some kind of quartz rich um, layer that's not entirely, in this case, pinched off. It's starting to starting to, to pinch. This place is pretty separated. So in three dimensions, these are these are lines. The Budins are, 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 are lines going in and out of the image. You can see that here in three dimensions where this has just happened to erode in a way where you know, we're, we've been looking at this face, but you can see these are, are linear features um, in this outcrop 3D view. So a lineation is a penetrative linear fabric. And we're focusing on lineations that are related to deformation. And this 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 kind of review of, of things we took notes on, different kinds of, of lineation. So the crenulation cleavage actually has a linear aspect to it. Um, minerals can be aligned um, in in a linear way. So here's an example. We've seen this slide before, but now think about it a different way. These this is a cleavage intersecting a bedding. So that intersection, if you follow this bed along the cleavage, that forms a line, and that's actually going to give you the um, hinge line of the fold. 
also saw this image before. You can see um, maybe in a higher higher resolution videos, little wrinkles that are running that have a, a crest that's running sort of northwest southeast, and here, and here, and here again. So those are those are basically fold hinges, and their intersection with this plane defines a lineation. In the microscopic view, you can see see those little crests showing up as these little bumps. And then, th and then on the, looking down on this microscopic view from the top, you you can see um, how those form. Um, a linear feature. So mineral lineation, minerals lining up due to deformation or some um, even settling of magma. Here's an example of stretching lineation. So there's a plane, this, this um, dark surface is like a some kind of, of of structural plane and you can see in that plane are linear features kind of running along like I'm waving the the mouse here so it's important to realize that these these lines um, like these lines, are, they don't, they're not planes. They don't, these don't intersect. They don't continue into this, into the depth of this, of this thing as a plane. We'll think more about this in the, in the lab outside. Here's some, here's another, you're looking down onto a planar surface and you can see very strong um, stretching of calcite. Here's a lineation defined by cobbles. So this is a conglomerate, um, and the these have been stretched. And when you look at the side view here, you don't see a very strong planar aspect. So mainly this has been in that sort of constriction, cigar shape um, strain field. So this would be a what we call an L tectonite, whereas going back a slide. There's a very strong plane as you're looking down on this. Um, you can see it's kind of just parts that have chipped off. But there's also a linear aspect to it. So this is an LS tectonite. 